Welcome to, to this week's section, which is about the humanitarian border. My name is Sinova Bendixson. I'm a social anthropologist. I'm working at the University of Bergen. And in my section today, I will take you through what I mean with the humanitarian border. <clears throat> For this section, you have two readings. One of them is an introductory lecture or introductory overview of the humanitarian border. And the second one is concerning, is giving you an empirical example of what we mean with the humanitarian border. And in this short introduction, I will refer to both of these readings. So I will suggest that you first do these readings and then you come back and listen to this talk. Today, I will talk to you briefly about borders. What is it that we mean with borders? I will talk about humanitarianism and then I will link these two borders and humanitarianism into the concept of the humanitarian border. And then finally, I will suggest how we can see this in Europe today. So this is usually how we think of borders. But in this section, we're asking you to think about borders differently than the territorial line, than the fence that you see, than the military operations that are very visual. We want you to think about how borders are not only at the territory. Instead, thinking with Balibar, we can think of how borders are everywhere, not only at the territory. We can talk, talk about internal and external bordering, for example, internal within the nation state, for example, by the receptionist at the emergency care center in Norway when a person without legal papers is trying to access health care. An external bordering would be at the font share showing your passport, for example. This is what is meant also with this concept of everyday bordering, bordering which takes place on the street in everyday life and which involves a variety of actors, such as street level bureaucrats and not only Frontex, although police and Frontex are also involved in this. So, Balibar has told us uh, very uh, and illustrated to us how the border can no longer, if it ever could be, understood as limited to the frontier of any nation state. Instead, it emerges at different instances movements and places wherever selective controls are to be found. And that's why Balibar is talking about the polysemic nature of borders, because the border works differently for different people. And we can think here particularly about the racialization of borders, how it is, and that is also tied up to gender. So how it is more likely who will be stopped and searched on the street in Oslo, in Marseille or München. This is very often racial processes. This means also it has another consequence, namely that borders are not always identified as borders by all concerned or in similar ways. And this is why Rumford asks us to do a multi-perspectival approach to the study of borders. How are borders experienced in different ways by differently positioned people? The other concept that we are looking at today is humanitarianism. Humanitarianism was a mainstream ideal that emerged in the 20th century. Uh, and in your readings, you will see a reference to Barnett, who is talking very well about humanitarianism, if you are interested in looking more into that. And so humanitarianism as a regime of care was pursued by NGOs and international organizations, particularly in times and places of exception due to war, disaster, violence. For example, think of the work of Red, Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. It's a humanitarian act, action which goes into very violent areas. So usually we think about humanitarianism as a positive thing. It is about care. It is about elevating human suffering. But what scholars, critical scholars, have pointed to, especially Malky, Fassin, Ager, is that humanitarianism unwittingly and sometimes unwillingly becomes tied up with control, biopolitics and victimization. And that is because NGOs and humanitarian organizations are linked to the governmental functioning of power. So these become contingent upon each other. The humanitarian organization and power are tied very complex ways together. And so that means that the control function, for example, the asylum policies, is linked to the function of protection. This means that the distinction between the governing hand and the caring hand are not always very clear cut. They become intermingled to each other. 
So what Ager is saying is that every policy of assistance is simultaneously an instrument of control over its beneficiaries. So humanitarian policies and practices which are made and created to relieve human suffering are ultimately political and they become part of justifying symbolic and physical violence. And this is something that we see then in the humanitarian border. So how are the border and humanitarian linked? The humanitarian border is defined by Walters as a complex, complex assemblage comprising particular forms of humanitarian reason. And look at the word reason being used. So it's a lot of how discourses are being used and implemented in order to legitimate certain actions which are taking place. So it's a lot about discourse, but it's also about practices. What ultimately it means is that humanitarian policies and practices which are created to relieve human suffering, they are simultaneously political. And so this humanitarian reason, as Fasan has showed, uh, this idea that a higher moral sentiment, such as respect for human life, elevation of suffering, this becomes part of politics and it becomes part of governing migration, a governance uh, uh, apparatus. And it is enacted through the idea of rescue and assistance. So it's not only discourse, of course, we also see Frontex, for example, going in and rescuing people. So researchers argue that humanitarian interventions, which focus on saving lives, simultaneously mask the violence of the border that are making people vulnerable in the first place. And that in practice, humanitarianism is not an innocent apparatus for rescuing life. Rather, humanitarianism is stepped in power structures with political effects. So how do we see this? in contemporary Europe. What do we mean with the humanitarian border in Europe? I'm here having uh, two, uh, one uh, uh, quote from uh, Palestine Wilkins, uh, the text that you should have read to today, uh, where uh, she writes, we took him from very deep waters, it was 10 degrees, and then we arrested him. So this is Frontex, a voice from Frontex saying. And what Palestine Wilkins uh, wants to show us is how this uh, France migrants, as as both at risk and a risk, as she puts it. And we see another example also from Palestine Wilkins text, the code of conduct for Frontex guards, which says, and I quote here, respecting human dignity at all times and paying particular attention to the need of vulnerable persons. So that's what Frontex should do. And through this way of the code of conduct and the expectations given to the Frontex, Frontex becomes actually a moral actor and a protector of human life. So it also becomes possible to front the idea that greater border security increased migrant safety without recognizing at the same time, of course, that it is that security in the first place which puts the migrant at risk and puts them in a situation where they need to be rescued. So the point with the humanitarian border and why we phrase the idea of the humanitarian border is to point, pinpoint that humanitarianism is not an innocent apparatus for rescuing life. Instead, it is steeped in power structures and it has political effects. Humanitarian interventions focusing on saving lives mask this violence uh, of the border, which is making people vulnerable in the first place. So border enforcement practices in Europe are going through a process of securitization, militarization, and humanitarization at the same time. And we see that humanitarian discourse and rationality is increasingly integrated in each other in the way that border enforcement efforts are both framed, so positioned to people through discourse, and justified. So this means that there is a discrepancy between the humanitarian self-perception of European member states an EU agency and the simultaneous support of policies which contribute to making life more precarious. We've seen a growing prominence of human rights discourse and humanitarian ideals being put forward in border policing practices and these coexist with the securitization of the border and this uh, is what we argue is a new mode of governance, it's a new part of policing which has been termed humanitarian borderlands.
for example, again, to take the Frontex, the mission of Frontex is framed and legitimized through the language of humanitarianism and human rights. At the same time as they, Frontex officers, find themselves complicit and practically involved in deeply inhuman conditions. So let me end this talk by just fronting some aspects that I really want you to have grasped uh, about this section of humanitarian borders. So migrant safety and border security discourse in Europe are closely knit. They're knit through official discourse and in policies and in practices, Frontex practices. What we see is an increased violent securitization of migration simultaneously as we have the emergence of humanitarian aid and service in the border region. So you have NGOs, you have helpers, you have refugee camps being set up at the same time as you're securing the borders. Finally, the humanitarian border is not fixed, but emerges through different forms of technologies of government. For example, administrating aid and shelter or rescuing operations. So humanitarian borders occurs in instances when humanitarianism is operationalized to manage a, po a political crisis and is also neutralizing public controversies on migrant situation. And that's why uh, we, we urge for an, uh, an increased need to study the humanitarian border and recognize how the humanitarian border has become part of border governance in Europe today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Good luck with the rest of your course.